Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 52. I'm Charlie Place and joining me today is an author who is also an artist and a playwright. His novel, Little, about Madame Tussaud, was a Times and Sunday Times Book of the Year and long-listed for, among others, the Dublin Literary Award and the Rathbones Folio Prize. Here today to talk about his recent publication, B, A Year in Plagues and Pencils, hello Edward Carey. Hello, Charlie. How are you? Very well. Thank you for having me here. It's good to have you. And you you are the first person I've had who also illustrates. So this is quite exciting. Was there a defining moment in your life when you realised you wanted to write and illustrate? I I think I was always doing both. And I always drew as a kid, like many kids. And I would try and put stories to the drawings. I mean, rough ideas, nothing big. But as I... I worked for theatre for a while, but then I started writing fiction properly or with more concentration. And I realised that I desperately wanted to have illustrations in my books. I feel like I can't really see my characters if I don't draw them first. Hmm. That's interesting. So that helps you progress the story. And is it the same with locations and things or is it a, a person thing? It's mostly a person thing. I I long to see them. I long to see the different shapes of them. When I do a drawing of a face of a character, the drawing will often contradict the writing. And then I think the drawing's right, so I'll change the writing. And so they sort of argue with each other. And then then the writing will be right and the drawing will be wrong. And slowly I get them to sort of agree with each other. If I'm making up places, like buildings that don't exist or whatever, I I tend to to try and draw them as well. It's also the best way of escaping from writing is uh, (laughs) is to draw. And you you pretend this is very important. This is part of it. Well, it is part of the the business for me as well, but I escape from one to the other. They sort of both support each other. So it helps burn out as well then, I suppose. Yes. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) So you're originally from Norfolk in England. But if I shorten it to plagues and pencils, you talk about what you like and dislike about Austin, Texas, which is where you now live, and what you miss. And there was a question that was probably beyond the scope of the book, but it was one I kept coming back to. So I'm going to have to ask, is the reason you live in Texas you're teaching? Yes, yes, it is. I teach at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm speaking to you from from the university. I'm in my office on campus And here at UT, as it's known, we have one of the most celebrated creative writing programs in America. And so I teach here with my wife, who is an American, though not a Texan, who's uh, also a writer. And we both teach it. And one of the great things, you know, you're saying about what what are you doing here in Austin, Texas, is we have a thing called the... The Ransom Center, which is in a building just behind the one I'm sitting in, which is one of the greatest collection of writers' papers in the world. It's world class and has amazing stuff. So I can just walk across of an afternoon and go and have a look at some of the notes that the Bronte sisters made, the actual notes that they have there. Or I can go and visit a lock of Mary Shelley's hair, or I can go and see a painting by William Blake. So that makes me feel closer to home too. And that uh, sounds amazing. I know I, I looked it up briefly when doing my research on you and I thought, my goodness, the amount of stuff here. Yeah, put it down for a trip at some point. You know, I have to go there. It is outrageous. They've got all Marquez's papers as well. They, they seem to have, have everything. Oil money can be useful, I guess. <laughs> and Austin is the liberal part of Texas, but it's a long, long way from home. And... I do long for it. And I think before too long, we will be heading back across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. If we go on to Plague and Pencils itself, it's the published collection of a big number of drawings that you made day by day during lockdown and the pandemic in general. And you posted them to Twitter and Instagram. I know you've probably been asked this a lot of times, but why did you start this project? It's a great question, and I didn't mean to do it. I was writing, as the pandemic started, I was writing a rather dark book set in a children's hospital. I'd been a a writer in residence of an amazing hospital in Florence, in Italy, and I was writing a book based on that experience, but it it was so difficult. I just felt I couldn't do it during those dark days, but I couldn't do nothing. And so I... 
I'm always drawing and I found myself scribbling a, a face of, of a character that I decided to, to call a determined young man. And often once I've done a drawing, I just shove it onto Twitter or Instagram or something. And, and it's a way of marking time. And I, as I was sending this determined young man off on Twitter, I suddenly said without really meaning it, that I would do a drawing a day until this nonsense is over, is what I wrote. Um, and I thought, yeah, I can do that. I'll, it'll probably be over in a month. <laughs> and then and there we and then there we are. But but slowly it grew from that. And of course it went on and on and it's still on. And I, in the end I drew five hundred four or five hundred days. And sometimes I would do two a day. Um so there's a little over five hundred drawings altogether. And the book publishes the first three hundred and sixty-five and a little more, the first full year. And so that's how it started. And and I didn't, I really honestly didn't mean to do it, but it suddenly became part of the ritual of the day. And quite soon it was, it was extraordinary, really, because people would respond so positively. I mean, it was, it was delightful. They would say, could you please draw me a puffin or a capybara or David Bowie or a pangolin or, you know, whatever. And, and so I would just draw what, what someone had suggested and slowly it grew. It, it's a book that I never meant to happen. And so it's sort of pure improvisation. But um, sometimes during that year, living in America, I know it was not easy in England, not easy anywhere, but living in America under Trump was particularly unpleasant. And there were such t horrific examples of police brutality all over the country. And in the end, I couldn't but mark exactly what was going on. It didn't seem right to be drawing, you know, a sleeping dormouse or something like that. Suddenly it seemed to be important to actually mark what was going on. And so I drew George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and and caricatures of Trump and uh, and his cronies, just because there was nothing else to do but address the horror, because it really was. I mean, I know it was horrible everywhere, but so something about being in America and seeing this misery unfold and seeing the brutality of the police, if you weren't marking it, then you weren't human. Hmm. Well... I think this is probably going to bring some of this in, but also going back to what you said earlier, and you took requests. And as you said, you know, this had you drawing different people, you've got authors, artists, musicians, and of course, still your own ideas. Was there any day's work or a couple of days work that defines the project for you in terms of the actual drawings? Um, I think probably that in terms of the whole thing, I think two things probably. Nobody could travel anywhere, of course. And suddenly... In our household, we just grew an appreciation for birds, for wildlife we hadn't had before. And so there's tons of drawings of birds in the book and what sort of hope they were giving during those those long, awful days. But the other one is the um, determined young man, the very first drawing. I kept track of him as the pandemic went on. So every 50 days, I would draw him and see what he looked like and I would imagine him sort of unshaven now and his hair getting longer and having lost a shirt button and his shirt getting messy and, and as it went on I think we were all going through such awful mental struggles and we were being led so appallingly by our politicians both side of the Atlantic and I started to twist his head but his head sort of spun unnaturally until it was completely upside down and I thought, yeah, this is the state we're in. And I began to draw another face coming out of his forehead and his actual face sort of decreasing. And so by the end of it, by the 500th drawing, the face that was on the forehead has become his new face. And his old face is a sort of permanent crease in his forehead. The final drawing, he looks very much, he resembles the, the first drawing, but he also looks slightly frightened and he also looks exhausted and he's also got two plasters on his arms because he's had both vaccinations and that arc to try and make some sense of those endless days and god knows i know they're not over i took him as a as a way of actually monitoring time in that sort of timeless period we had that stretched on for so long representative of loads of people right <laughs> 
a very very kind of um light question how many pencils did you get through i i think it was about 200 or something like that which doesn't sound very many but i kept all the stubs I use a thing called a pencil extender, which means that you can use the pencil right down until it looks like a cigarette butt. And um, they're kind of beautiful. In fact, I'm I'm holding one as I speak to you now. So actually keeping the pencil stubs was part of it as well. And so every 50 pages, not only would I do another drawing of the determined young man, but I would lay all the drawings out so far on the floor of our house in Austin and also take a picture of a plate filled with pencil stubs. (laughs) And you use, the book is called B, and then you've got the kind of subtitle year in Plague and Pencils. Can you tell us about your art supplies and the pencils that you use? Yeah, I I discovered a couple of years ago when I was uh, working on another book that having used many different pencils over different years and not having any allegiance to any particular pencil, I suddenly came across my perfect pencil, which is going to sound very geeky probably, but there is a pencil, the grade of the pencil is B, Um, And it's made by a company called Tombow from Japan. And this seems to me the most perfect pencil in all the world. I absolutely love it. It's softer than an ordinary B, but, you know, it's not as soft as a 2B. And it seems that with that, just one pencil, you can, you know, draw the darkest dark, but also the faintest trace uh, of a mark with a pencil. I just love it. And it seems to me that that almost all pencil grades are contained within the Tombow B. And so I named the book after the grade of pencil, after the pencil I used, because I was also thinking endlessly about, we're also, you know, just barely being, that's all we were doing. And so I would just thought, yeah, B, that's what, that's what I'll call it. Because I just spent a year staring at these pencil stubs, which are each marked with a B. So it seemed to me, that's what I call it, B. Yeah, why not? There we are. Oh, wonderful. If you, I'm guessing you don't run out of these pencils, you probably buy quite a stock of them. But uh, if you're ever in a situation where you don't have one, what's your next best to use? I, I would be in an absolute state of horror. Um, <laughs> but uh, I would kind of use anything, I suppose, to hand. I've, I've never run out of bees lately, though I noticed looking at a bowl of pencil stubs from a different book, I've got an HB in there but also a Tombow, which are slightly softer than ordinary pencils, all of them right down the grades. But yes, I would use anything. I would use ink. I mean, I'm always drawing, I draw with pen and ink, and you know, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world if I had no bees, but it would be it would be damn near it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've all got our favourite things and we find them and we want to use them, yeah. We've talked about how your drawings uh, reflect what's going on and things like that. You often drew people who wrote or created in quarantine or an isolation. Can you talk about this and and the people that were chosen and things like that and how they relate to what you were trying to do? Yes, well, so some of the the writers to begin with, I would do, I would draw, say, Samuel Pepys, who, of course, was in London during the plague. And I would draw King Lear because King Lear was written by Shakespeare during during a plague. But then... I tried to push that as far as it would go. Robert Louis Stevenson was ill through much of his childhood and his adulthood and wrote very movingly about traveling in your own private space, i.e. not about in the world, but probably stuck in a bedroom. And he wrote a wonderful poem called The Land of Counterpane, um, in which he sees his sheets and bedding as mountains and valleys and adventurous places. And you could see, you know, the the first grain, perhaps, of Treasure Island coming from this isolation. But I also, I had been reading about isolated writers for a different book, which we'll probably talk about a bit later. And one of the books I read was one by a soldier called Xavier de Mestre, who is a, a Frenchman who was put under house arrest in the 1700s. And he wrote his masterpiece, which is called A Voyage Around My Room, in which he travels just stuck in a single room and talks about how marvellous the journey from, say, a desk to a bed is. And there's something so beautiful about that. And we all travel inside and we all had a kind of, we stored up our travels, I guess, like a camel during lockdown and remembered remembered our travels and had to use our imagination. So I'd often draw, you know, writers 
who deal with that, with imagining places. You know, one of my favorite novelists is Georges Perec, who imagined an, an entire house in his masterpiece, Life, a user's manual. Yeah, so I was trying to link, if I could, I would link those writers and artists, like I would do Frida Kahlo, who, who traveled while, while kept in bed. And so I wanted to, you know, to acknowledge those writers that have inspired us in the past and gave us such an imagination. So I would also draw Theodore Kittelsen, who is a Norwegian artist who predominantly painted trolls. Not sweet trolls. These are terrifying trolls and they're quite, quite glorious. People would ask him, why are you, why are you spending your life painting trolls? And he would say, oh, well, they're much more real than people in society. And he was frightened himself of actually going out. He lived near near sort of woodland in, in Norway, but feared to step in because for him, he believed the trolls were there. And one of the other figures that I drew and I drew after him was this character called Pesta. And she is the embodiment of plague. And she's in Norwegian folklore. And she walks around and when you see her, it kind of means curtains for you. And so I drew Pester and Plague Doctors and Black Death um, and Death itself, but also sort of in hopefully slightly humorous drawings, but just to acknowledge what we were all going through, but also wonders, you know, drawing people like Tova Janssen or Isaac Dinesen or Frida Kahlo or these, you know, Tony Morrison, all these writers that also give us great hope and light. Mm-hmm. I didn't see your original Twitter postings, you know, so my context was purely from the book. And I remember looking through it solely and, and, and wondering about these authors and fully um, acknowledging my ignorance here. It didn't quite click to me first. But yeah, I love how you've got this detailing of isolation and quarantine in, in all its kind of senses. The book rarely includes the date for the drawings, I noticed, where, of course, on Twitter, the posts are going to be timestamped. Uh, I think you've got one of Carrie Fisher for May the 4th. Was there any reason that the dates weren't included in the book? Well, I think we just wanted to not have too many words because I think then it would be it would be burdened with, with too much. It was just, a you know, you would see each day and sometimes, you know, Christmas Day is marked or you'd see, you know, Election Day coming up in America or there would be a day when, you know, something political would happen and that would be stamped that way. For example, I drew the Bastille on Bastille Day, and it says that. So, so I think when the day became important to Mark, or particularly relevant, like I drew Guy Fawkes on Guy Fawkes Night, then it says so in a book. But otherwise, otherwise it doesn't. It would just say a fox or Georges-Louis Borges or a sheep. <laughs> you know, um, the idea is really to show how that year just sort of went by and... And I've never kept a diary before, and I've never actually sort of weighed a year so consistently. So, that I mean, that was the reason really not to mark every day, because if you put it there each time, then it wouldn't actually be information. It also allows the drawings that you've done of events that are important and that need to remain important. It allows them to kind of continue as such in, in that way. So uh, I'm thinking... You've got the drawings of George Floyd and then you've got Breonna Taylor afterwards. And I suppose without the date, it gives you the idea that these are still continuing, which of course they are. Yes, exactly. And I, these drawings, because I did one a day and, you, you know, that I was also teaching and, and writing and looking after kids and all that at the same time. Sometimes I would do a drawing and go, oh, I'm not sure I like that drawing, but it would still go in. You know, it would still become part of it because sometimes we don't like the day, do we? And that's just how it is. It's, it was still a day. And so I drew Breonna Taylor twice because I, I wasn't convinced by my first drawing, but later on it became clear just how corrupt the legal system was and how stacked against this poor black woman everything was as her murder trial came up and I had to draw her again it was just so vile seeing everything you're really seeing how kind of screwed America is hmm. um, yeah sorry that sounds very bleak but those were bleak bleak days and I'm fearful f for the future mm -hmm. you drew for a total of 500 days and obviously 
you've got, as you said, 365 days included in the book. When was the moment you you knew you had finished? <laughs> well, I thought when we got to 365, some people were saying, is that it? Are you done? Are you done? And I remember as I was getting towards the end, I would go, oh, no, there are some of my heroes I haven't drawn yet. And I couldn't <laughs> bear the idea of not having them in. Um, and so I very quickly towards the end, there's kind of, hello, what's that person doing there? Um, but I was got to have Goya in there, got to have Bulgakov, because I wanted them to appear in the book but I knew then it would be a book it wasn't you know I didn't set out to make a book but then by then my UK publisher said yeah let's make it a book and I said wow yeah let's do it thank you but then to finish at 365 we were still we were still in it Mm. and it didn't feel like an ending in my family we were still stuck in Austin we hadn't left Texas the entire time and I just thought, no, 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 not yet, not yet. And it also, 365 is such an unsatisfying number. And I felt like, could I make it to 500? 500 sounds perfect. And 500 would give me enough time to set the determined young man right, because his head was in absolute chaos by um, day 350. So I thought, no, 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 if I visit him a few more times, then I can get him back again. And so I was kind of following his path. That seemed like this sensible thing. But also, I started the pandemic in London, and my family was supposed to come and join me and was supposed to go up to Edinburgh. But then, of course, everything that we all know started to happen. And instead, I had to retreat back to my family in Austin. But I can remember walking around St. Paul's looking up at the cathedral and going, oh my God, when am I going to see, when am I going to see this again? And everybody was on their mobile phones, just everybody was talking about it, really felt, oh my God, this is, what is this? This, I've never heard this, anything like this before. So I went, I came back to Austin, but I realized that without quite meaning to, I could follow actually my travels for the last part of the drawings. And so the penultimate drawing, in fact, that I did was of St. Paul's Dome, because on that day, 499, I was finally back in London again and by the cathedral. And so that seemed to me also the right journey to have gone journeying just stuck in a small house in Austin to actually having got out towards the end of it. That seemed to me the right journey to follow for the 500. Though I will say by a complete coincidence and you know this was not planned in any way on day 365 i was given my second pfizer vaccine on that actual day it was just one of those nice coincidences i guess so that is also makes the year seem like a natural end as well it finishes off the book really well and i like how you drew yourself kind of behind the mask as well in that one Yes. And I know you said that you haven't written a diary before, but you have effectively now got a diary of a year. Do you think you might consider doing anything similar again? Never. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, well, who knows? But I think it was wonderful to do it. I'm very glad. To, I'm very glad to have done it. I'm delighted by this sort of extra book that I'd never quite expected to to do. I hope this new variant won't be as horrible as what we've seen before. I just want not to write a diary. Mm. Served an important purpose and it's been very powerful, but yeah. It's kind of a rounding up, I suppose, on this part of the conversation. And obviously, you know, we, we've looked at it in total, but if we can maybe funnel to a little bit, what effect did this project have on you? Oh, um... I don't know. I mean, it, I felt like I reached more people than I had before. Somehow people would write from different parts of the world and say, hey, could you draw such and such? And that was a, as an amazing thing. So it felt like connecting to the world at a time when we were all so isolated. It was wonderful to draw my wife, draw my kids, drew my mother. The book's dedicated to my mother. I couldn't see her. She's in uh, Suffolk. I couldn't see her all year. So it became quite personal in the end, in a way that I always try to disguise myself in writing. So 
So I guess this is the book that I reveal myself perhaps more than any other directly. You know, there's self-portraits in there, which is something I would never normally do in a million years. But it was a way of, of finding some sort of community in very bleak days. And when people would write, please, please, could you draw such and such? And then they would respond with, you know, genuine happiness afterwards. It was, it was delightful. Lovely. If we move on then. So you've got The Swallowed Man, which is your latest novel, and it's out in paperback on the 4th of April. Can you introduce it to us? Yeah, so this novel came from a commission. I was approached by the Parco di Pinocchio in Collodi in Tuscany, in Italy, to do an exhibition in the Parco di Pinocchio, which is Pinocchio Park. And there everything is dedicated to Carlo Collodi's famous puppet. And they said, would I do an art exhibition? They have this lovely gallery space. And I went, yes, God, yes, I love to. One of the <laughs> one of the greatest joys that I have as a teacher is teaching to my graduate students fairy tales. We get lost in that in those essential stories, and it's a wonderful thing. And and we talk about Carlo Collodi among among many other writers. So I know Pinocchio and I I love Pinocchio for for a very long time. So I thought, yes, of course, I will do my illustrations to The Adventures of Pinocchio by Carlo Collodi. But as I went back to read the book again, you know, and having read it many, many times, I suddenly became aware that Collodi, Carlo Collodi, whose real name was Carlo Lorenzini, who names himself after the small town of Collodi, Collodi leaves Geppetto inside the belly of an enormous sea beast for two years. And he just leaves it there. He's not, he's not useful to the plot. So we'll just keep him inside the belly of this giant fish for a long, long time until Pinocchio is ready to, to rescue him. And I suddenly thought, but what was that like for Geppetto being stuck inside the sea beast for two years? And I thought, oh God, why don't I make the art that Geppetto would make whilst he lived inside this monster. Because Geppetto was an artist, after all, his most famous piece of art, of course, being his son, Pinocchio. And so I set about creating the art and I thought, what would he create? He would have to create, he would have to create or he would go mad. And to keep his sanity, he would draw and paint. And so I started, I started making the art, but as I started, Doing that, I realized, no, 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 it's not just that. It also needs to be his journal. It needs to be his time spent in the whale and tracking his his uh, journey. So you'll see, see now, Charlie, as I'm explaining this, how these two books actually belong to each other. Yes. And I hadn't meant it. I, I wrote The Swallowed Man before there was any sniff of covid and people, some people have said to me afterwards, what would you do? Is there anything you would do differently about The Swallowed Man? And I said, yes, I wouldn't write it. I would go and travel and then see friends and everything while I still could before lockdown. <laughs> but as it happened, before lockdown, I sat in a darkened room trying to be an old man stuck inside a fish. So I wrote, I wrote his journal. So this book is actually a sort of an exploration of parenthood and also that business of creation and how we create, how we use our own imagines, imaginations to keep ourselves alive, to keep things moving, um, to make our tiny world seem bigger. And this is what Geppetto does throughout, throughout the book. You know, if you only know Pinocchio by the Disney film, then you're doing the book a great disservice because it's actually weird and wonderful and very strange and very exciting and very, very dark and odd and heartbreaking. So for me, I think actually Pinocchio is to be placed just beside books like Frankenstein. After all, Geppetto has created a monster. And Pinocchio is a monster. He's not the sweet, pliable young man in Disney. He's actually, he's a horror. He's uncontrollable and, and, and delightful because of it. He breaks laws and, and is, is extraordinary. Right early on in the, in, in the novel, he picks up a mallet and smashes the talking cricket, kills it. Jiminy Cricket, dead. And also very early on, 
Feeling cold, Pinocchio puts his uh, feet on a fire to warm them and burns his own legs off until they're stumps. It's a really interesting and very dark book and, and absolutely, absolutely thrilling. And Collodi wanted it to finish when Pinocchio is hanged by the cat and the fox by an, an enormous oak tree, which still exists, the oak tree, by the way. In fact, I'm looking at a leaf from it in my office. Uh, I visited it in Collodi. So it's a really interesting, very dark, very strange book. And the last thing that happens in Collodi's novel is so moving. And so I think it's one of the biggest betrayals in all literature. Pinocchio has been turned into the flesh child, finally. We know that, of course, from Walt Disney. But what's different is that the puppet remains behind, like a sort of exoskeleton or um, like a snake skin or something, and it's beside him. So the flesh child is looking at the wooden child, and the, the novel ends with the flesh child laughing at his former self, and it's utterly heartbreaking. And so I wanted to write Geppetto's side of this story, what it m would mean, the horror of actually creating something that came to life, and then his longing to find it. At first, purely for commercial reasons, he thinks he's made a fortune with this talking object, but latterly out of parental love and, and longing to find his lost child. I didn't know the original too much myself, but you can't help but wonder. Obviously, with Disney, it makes sense. They've made him into a really nice boy and he becomes a real boy. And yet, obviously, the Pinocchio you describe is awful and he still becomes a real boy. Yeah, he's a, he's a delinquent, but he's wonderful. Of course, what do children want to read? Well, why is Pippi Longstockings, for example, so, so successful? Because she's outrageously naughty, and so is Pinocchio. And in fact, gets his father arrested and put in prison the first night of his life. Gosh, yeah. I'll, I'll have to give that a go after I read that one. <laughs> uh, should we have your reading? It seems like an appropriate moment. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just read the, the first page, if that's all right. Mm-hmm. This is how it begins. This is Geppetto's voice. I am writing this account in another man's book by candlelight inside the belly of a fish. I have been eaten. I have been eaten, yet I am living still. I've tried to get out. I've made many attempts, but I must conclude that it is not possible. I am trapped within an enormous creature and I'm slowly being digested. I have found a strange place to exist, a cave between life and death. It is an unhappy miracle. I'm afraid of the dark. The dark is coming for me. I have candles, they are my small protection, and I have this purloined book that I shall slowly fill. Before the last candle dies, I'll tell my tale. I give you fair warning, I can boast you no battlefields. This is no murderous story, there is no great romance. But before all this, back on land, I did an extraordinary thing, an impossible thing. And for that thing, in order that the world may be put back in balance, I am now paying a severe cost. I shall tell my terrible shame, my tale of the supernatural, though so devastatingly real. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> I think this question might fit in well here. You wrote a stage adaptation of Pinocchio. I did. I did. It was, a, it was a, an adaptation of the Collodi book, but linked also with a different adaptation of Pinocchio, a wonderful adaptation of Pinocchio by the American novelist Robert Coover. And Robert Coover came up with the incredible idea if you do go, Charlie, if you do go back and read the book, you'll find, oh, my God, there's so much flesh in this tale. Uh, and Coover's inspired idea was, well, we know that Pinocchio at the uh, end of Claudia's book is a flesh child. Yeah, so he's going to grow up into being a man. But what happens if, as he gets older, if, as he's very old, he starts to turn back into a puppet? 
And this is what happens in Pinocchio in Venice. And he's he's become a university professor and he's in Venice. I'm not quite sure why Cuba's put it in Venice, except for it being a wonderful city, of course, a wonderful playground, but your character's in. But Pinocchio is very, very, very Tuscan. He's marked by being Tuscan. And for example, Pinocchio always addresses Geppetto, his father, as Babbo, which is uh, the particularly Tuscan name for father. So in Kuva's incredible version of this story, as he's talking, for example, as Professor Pine Nut, as he's become known, one of his ears will fall off. And he becomes rigid and turns sort of back into to wood and he slowly loses parts of himself. And it's a wonderful look at, well, old age and deaths, really. And I did this adaptation in, in Romania for, for one of the national theatres of Romania. And it was an amazing experience that actually, you know, changed my life actually being in Romania doing, doing this big production because it needed a cast of, I think maybe they had 30 in the cast. And, you know, it was, it was a kind of huge, extravagant thing. And, and we did it with this company by this incredible Romanian director called Silvio Pucaretti. And so we mixed and we went on tour around England and we did performances in Romania. We would have Pinocchio in Venice one night and another night we would have Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus and the cast would double up doing things. So it was it was an amazing experience. So, yeah, Pinocchio's been, well, sometimes in the background, but always present in your life for a very long time then. Yeah, he has. I mean, I, I I find him so fascinating. And I hadn't realised actually quite what a, a place he had in, in my life, um, in my writing life. I often give objects names and voices animated. For example, I wrote a, I wrote a kids trilogy called the Ironmonger Trilogy, and it's set in Victoria in London. And in it, the, the lead male character, a young boy called Claude, has the gift of hearing objects talking. And I think it's linked from Pinocchio, but it's also linked from going to places like the Foundling Hospital Museum in London, where you can see the objects that invariably mothers left when they delivered their baby or small child to the Foundling Hospital. And the hope was that these objects I mean, they're very humble objects. They might be a, a thimble or a, a label for a gin bottle, for example, or something like that, was all that tied the child to the mother. And you can see those objects. They're incredibly powerful at the museum. And of course, they're heartbreaking to see them because, of course, in almost all cases, these objects were never given. They were never given to the child, um, but the mother never came came back for the child. And in Florence... There is a, the, in the Ospedale degli Innocenti, which is also a foundling's hospital, there is also these objects. But in Florence, they would guillotine the objects, cut them in half. And one half would stay with the hospital and one half would go with the mother. You long to put the object together for the object to become one again. And so in Florence, you can see these objects, these halved objects, which of course never found their other halves again. And they're profoundly moving and incredibly powerful, the sort of power of objects. And when I was in Florence, I stayed in Florence kind of numerous times, but, and I mentioned it right at the beginning of this program, I was a writer in residence for this incredible, incredible children's hospital, just, well, it's in Florence, it's just outside the city walls. And in their hospital, they have Pinocchios everywhere. And of course, it's something the children recognize and they love Pinocchio. They love his outrageousness. They love his spirit that he won't give in. But they in the hospital are speaking to doctors, surgeons, nurses. Uh, when I was there, think of Pinocchio as being the figure of hope for the children, that this journey from puppet to child is actually the journey of illness to health. And so for that, you ask me, you know, Pinocchio means so much. Yes, he does mean so much. And actually just seeing the Italian children in distress, actually being soothed by the familiarity of Pinocchio. And of course, it makes one think also of J.M. Barry, who gave the rights of Peter Pan to Great Ormond Street Hospital in London in an amazing, generous gesture to help all those 
children out. But yeah, so Pinocchio, yes, absolutely. I adore him. And I think he's so exciting and strange. And I would put him next to, yeah, Frankenstein's monster any day. With more positive effects, definitely, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this very positive and also very powerful story. We will leave it there. It sounds fantastic. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm definitely going to go and, and read it myself because I'm, I'm big on looking at Alice in Wonderland. So that might be yeah. something I, I need to look at as well. Uh, I know we've spoken about a lot, but is there anything else that we haven't talked about or we haven't talked about in enough depth or et cetera, et cetera, that you would like to mention before we finish? Um, no, except just to say kind of briefly is that, you know, one of the other things I was doing during all this lockdown thing, because I couldn't couldn't get the novel I was working on to go right. And I was missing England so much and I was missing theatre so much. And I come from Norfolk, as you mentioned earlier on. I've written a novel during the pandemic, which I'm just working on edits with my editor in America uh, and now set in a theatre in Norwich. And I was endlessly thinking of England throughout the pandemic and of theatre. And this was one way of combining both. So that's something to look for, for listeners to look out for. I hope so, yes. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. OK, well, Edward, it's been wonderful having you today. This has been very illuminating for me, uh, studiously wise. Wonderful to talk to you and about your books. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you, Charlie, so much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Links to purchase B, A Year in Plagues and Pencils, as well as The Swallowed Man are in the episode description. If you have enjoyed today's discussion, do subscribe or follow the podcast on your listening app of choice. It's totally free. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 52, was recorded on the 10th of December 2021 and published on the 10th of January 2022. Music and production by Charlie Place.